Thank you, Jens. And <clears throat> I guess in temperance, um, really respecting that on whom you operate on and why determines more the outcome than how you do it. And really, MIS, the only advantage is you preserve the soft <coughs> tissue envelope. And because of that, there's a little less blood loss and a little less infection. But the outcomes are very much dependent on whom you operate on and why. And, and so I, I, get, I wanna carry that through because this isn't for every fracture and I don't operate on more people because of it, because I do MIS at this point in my career. I probably did early on when I was kind of enthusiastic and you know everybody else was getting two liter blood losses and I was getting patients out the next day. Um, my conflict, I still have quite a legacy to Mayo. I, probably more income comes from my legacy than uh, some of the partners back there, but that said, I don't get much of it at this point. So that is a conflict, it is Mayo IP. I actually don't use the Medtronic stuff to avoid conflict at this point. The only on-label use is where we do a posterior instrumentation with fusion of all levels. Rod long fuse short is an off-label use of FDA approved items. And you really have to know that because there was a clarification to avoid people putting a Fenstrom ball in uninstrumented uh, levels. That was clarified by the FDA as being clearly out of bounds. So you have to discuss that with patients. Uh, I don't market MIS to say that it's the end all be all and uh, I'm a car enthusiast, but recognize there's misleading people. There are people that use MIS for marketing that really don't have wherewithal or, or purpose. The minimally invasive thoracolumbar literature, and I know this is small because what's important to recognize is there's more meta-analysis than there is primary data. <laughs> when there's more meta-analysis than primary data, you know there's a problem. And most of the data is on AOA-type fractures on whom none of us in North America would operate on. Most of the, the Chinese die series and things, those are AOA1 fracture. They're superior end plate fractures that we would do no brace and we would have mobilized in PT and back to sport by three months. And again, you have to be careful on what's reported because uh, in Europe and in China, they're very, very aggressive about operating on these. And so their outcomes have to be metric to on whom you're operating on and what that patient is. So again, those things are there, but they're not really as relevant. I'm in Sun City West, it's the prostate cancer, uh, actually STD and uh, osteoporosis capital of the country. <laughs> Those folks grew up in the 70s and they're still going at it. And uh, so uh, you have to do a little extra testing in your pre-op. So, but uh, kyphoplasty, vertebroplasty, you know, those are real issues. It's, uh, you know, a huge uh, worldwide consumption, but especially in the United States, 40% of women have a lifetime event. It's a $17 billion economic impact. One million, uh, sorry, one billion in direct, direct reimbursement to physicians. And of course, there's incredible impetus for uh, proceduralists to do the procedures. There's a two week uh, uh, period after you have to follow them and boom, those patients are gone. So again, what was the big issue in 2011 when it was such a controversy? The problem was patients were getting intervention based on their radiographs, not on their clinical picture. And the Neridian guidelines have significantly changed that. And of course, for metastatic lesions, that is a life event changer. So in the right selected patient for METS, the right selected patient with an osteopenic insufficiency fracture, this is minimally invasive surgery at its really best outcome. You improve health quality of life, but you have to do it on the right patient. And the Neridian criteria has very, very well defined that and again, but institutions, uh, like one in my neighborhood, got to pay the OIG four million because they're zipping patients from the ER to an outpatient observation area to get a kypho by a radiologist and then not be followed. So again, clinical decision on whom you operate and why is what's most important. But we're here to talk about MIS. MIS has a learning curve. There's ways you can get by and better ways to do it. Um, Having coached, uh, that happens to be my daughter, one of my best friends says she skates well because he coached her and I coached his daughter. His daughter skates horribly but is very successful. So it t you can do things a bunch of different ways. But the key thing is that you spare the muscle envelope. So MIS, if you really define it, it's when you don't fillet the muscles off the back. Because if you fillet a fish, you fillet a salmon, the muscle's dead, it's denervated. If it contracts as it heals more than 10%, it cannot it cannot contract to affect motion. So again, when you put in screws, I'm sorry, it's, something didn't come through there. But again, the key is 
you're just putting in a, a fixation point. And getting that in safely has been very well defined for a couple decades. Kevin Foley did a great job of educating people. You come in the pedicles at 10 and 2. If you use a beveled trocar, which hopefully I can show you in the lab, you can steer that. It's like a curveball. If you use a trocar, it's just a punch. So again, having a steerable bevel is the way you want to go, 10 and 2. And again, you want to actually get the uh, pedicle screws in the pedicle, not in the joint. Now that may seem kind of obvious, but when you get them in the joint, you denervate the joint. And that's the model of arthritis, the Panuki model. If you denervate a joint and you give it a mechanical perturbation, you get osteoarthritis. That's, that's the model for it. And again, what happens when people put in perk screws? Well, Rob Isaacs um, and Duke, 30% of their screws were in the joints. That's horrible. Actually, Ed Benzel showed that about 10 years ago. If you put the screw in the joint, you get early adjacent segment disease. So you gotta get them in where you need them and make sure they're there. And the key principle is that on a PA, an, an oblique if you wanna do it, the lateral, that you're in within the osseous confines of the pedicle at the base of the pedicle. And I, I try to save those shots every level, every time. Now people say you can give yourself a ton of floral. Yes, you can if you're not careful, but if you put in if you and the fellow or you and the resident, or right now me and my PA, we both do a side, we put in two trocars, we do one shot. Guide those in, base the pedicle, another shot. So typically, I can put in six screws or eight screws, two rods, in less than 30 seconds of floral. Pretty deliverable, low end of maybe 18, top end maybe 40 if they're small. But again, the bevel tip is what lets you steer and reduces a lot of those shots, and also setting it up in cognitively making a decision when you make every shot. Sometimes you have floral techs who want to shoot whenever they please, you got to stop them. Knowing their name, having that negotiation ahead of the first floral shot helps. And again, those are really, really important things to reduce your lifetime floral exposure. So again, dual floros, <laughs> we did that and studied it. You can reduce the number of shots, but not as much as I thought. It didn't take our floro time in half. It took it down by about 20%. And again, big expenditure, hard to work around. I found I was kind of doing more shots because I was leaning. So again, most 80% of your work, 90% of your work is done on the PA. You get all your trocars in or guide wires and then one lateral. So again, insertion technique. What's important is when you're at the neurocentral junction, you've got basically uh, about 30% of your, of your purchase. When you're basically 70% uh, of the way into the body, that's where you have 80% of your uh, purchase. And if you're 80% of the way into the body, you gotta recognize the body's conical, you're out the front. And I don't purposely put screws out the front unless we're doing the sacrum. And again, that adjacent segment disease is real. So you gotta get an oblique trajectory. You gotta go from the lateral border medial or else you're in the joint, especially at L4. And again, the faculty equaled the trainees at Duke. I'm not dishing on Rob, but it is what it is. And uh, anyways, lateral pullout. It's another problem. If you got you know, big, beefy resins, like Kirk, you know, he, he used to muscle things around a lot. You know, he'd always break the screws out the side. That happened in open techniques, but you usually saw it. The problem with MIS techniques is you don't see the, uh, the, the, sh the seat of the uh, screw, the saddle of the screw. You don't see the screw trajectory. So you can break out the side of the body and say, hey, what happened? That was in, and now it's out. And that's the derotation force. Many of the um, MIS systems do not have a very good articulation between the screw and your screwdriver. In transition for two of the major companies uh, from one screw design to another, they eliminated the interface between the shaft of the screw and the screwdriver. And it was basically just an interference fit over the, oh, to the tulip. They said, well, it doesn't matter because you're going over wire. Well, if you get more than 10 to 15 degrees of angulation between the wire and the screw, you bind the wire and the screw, and you can drive it through the front of the body. So we'd prefer you not go there. Many people augment screws. Augmenting the whole screw is better, but then you can squirt it out the, uh, the pedicle. And again, that, that has a significant strength enhancement um, if you wish. When I do it, I generally just put about a half cc each pedicle, put the screw in and go. And again, maximizing each point of fixation, especially in, uh, in osteopenic and osteoporotic patients. Remembering that when you were open, you could line up your sagittal plane 
of your screws and your chronal plane of your screws, your rod would fit pretty easily. If you're going to do that for MIS, you've got to do that radiographically. You've got to be pretty certain that there's a nice sweeping curve on your sagittals and that you're not too far out of line chronally because if you have a mismatch of the height of the, of the tulips on either of those planes, you're going to have difficulty seating your rod or you're going to have to pull out one of the screws to get it to match to the rod. And that offset can be quite a problem. This is an example of, um, you know, used to put all my wires in first because we do it often under nav, you know, because we had it. Then if you do your T-lift or you do some type of um, muscle dilating approach to the inner space, you can bend the wire. And then the wire incarcerates. And again, you can't advance it or windshield wipers out of the pedicle. And this is actually a, a significant problem, especially in osteopenic patients. So you have to be collinear as you put in your screw. If it's not going, it's not advancing, you better look, because you've probably kinked the screw over the wire. So again, stuff that can go wrong that does. This is an example of a lateral pullout, a torque out. And again, wires were clearly in, but as the screws were put in because they bound, they kind of wiped out the pedicle. So again, those screwdriver wire challenges are real. Most of the companies have worked through that in the last couple years, but about three years ago, that was a big issue. Again, muscle, what's the difference between doing a Wiltsy trough and a muscle dilating approach? When you do a Wiltsy trough, you denervate the paraspinal muscles. When you do a muscle dilation, you put in a tube, there's no pressure against the muscles after you've dilated. So they don't undergo compartment syndrome. And again, the other way to spin it, some people like to do the multiple, multiple bric-a-brac incisions. I tend to make one midline incision. This happens to be thoracolumbar deformity. But then you work between the paraspinous and thoracolumbar muscle planes. And then you can close it back to one nice, neat midline incision. Also gives you a great working space. So again, uh, what about the accuracy? Certainly this has been shown that you can be accurate as long as you hit that ordinal of your inside the pedicle medial wall at the base of the pedicle on the lateral. And that's a deliverable that you have to reproduce every time, every case, every screw. But with that, there are very few breaches relative to open, pretty comparable. The, uh, if you use fluoro live, you're going to fry yourself. And you'll have, no, uh, you'll have no lenses by the time you're done with your career. You can't do that. It has to be spot imaging. When you look at kyphoplasty times, you know, if you're having kyphoplasty times over a minute, you're doing something wrong. If you can't put screws in with, uh, you know, less than four to five seconds per screw, you got to learn a new technique. And that's why a lot of people haven't adopted uh, MIS, is they feel their personal radiation exposure is too high. Rod passage are some sweeping techniques I can show you in the lab that you can basically, it's easier to, to pass a bent rod than a straight rod. And one of the really uh, infrequently discussed issues is if the rod is not subfascial when you pass it, for example, if you use the large extenders that have the 60 millimeter window or more, when you put that rod down, you're crushing the fascia. So you have to get the rod underneath the fascia to start with. And if you haven't, then you've got to release it just like you would a compartment syndrome with a pair of scissors. Otherwise, those patients wake up with excruciating back pain because you're crushing their muscle and fascia. So again, you've got to get the rod subfascial. You've got to get it right in the neighborhood. The first generation of implants I helped design, uh, we created a 15 millimeter window because we didn't want to have a 30 or 50 millimeter window to crush the fascia. But everybody else wanted a full big window. So next generation, it got more popular than appropriate. And so now there's more problems, actually, with people crushing, crushing fascia. And that's why the separate entry point, you, were, you made sure you were subfascial. But most people want to pass it right down through, which you can do, but you got to release or cut the fascia. In trauma, I, I most frequently do separate incisions because of, there's often a beat up. If they have a PLC injury, they've got an injury to the soft tissues dorsally. Also in a tumor, I do this so that they can go to radiation quickly. We start most of the patients in XRT or IMRT the next week. And if you don't have a midline incision, it won't dehiss. And if an incision does dehiss over the muscle, you can pack that and treat that that way. So again, purposely, we, we do a separate approach. Again, if you're going to do fastectomies, um, it's best to do them before you put the screw in so that you have room. And again, it's easy. Once the wire's there, you can decorticate around the wire, put in whatever substrate you want to get fusion and then uh, pass the, uh, the, the screw over the wire to, to accomplish that.
Iliac screws are pretty uh, easy to align. Instead of doing a, um, an iliosacral or a sacroiliac screw, I tend to go on the inner wall of the ilium and shoot the teardrop. So it's an inside out technique that actually Jens defined, uh, what, 15, 18 years ago? You talked about that? It's, uh, in, it's in the trauma literature. But that inside out technique, you don't violate the SI joint, and you have a huge window to put your screw in, and the screw head is lower than the PSIS, so the patients don't have a lot of tenderness dorsally. So again, little things that make a big difference. If you're doing deformity, you gotta get the rod bend right. Most of the time you have to pass the rod, and then in sight you bend the rod to match and really accomplish the lordosis. Neil and Ann and I, who, who developed the first generation of this uh, implant system, have a, a very distinct, different background in training and deformity. And again, a lot of the flat back created by uh, the laterals, you can make worse if you percutaneously instrument and don't get that rod bend right. And uh, again, I tease Dave Polly, whom uh, you know, Kirk and I uh, trained around, that uh, you can create a lot of very distinct flat backs if you fix both ends of the implant and then you bring the rest of the uh, spine up to the flat rod. Don't do that. Again, navigation with floral. Um, uh, I use navigation. I check with floral because especially if there's deformity, it, it can kind of give you a little bit of a mismatch. Again, uh, MIS fusion rates are, are very good generally, comparable to open uh, rates. The, uh, the one exception, you know, facet fusions done in MIS, uh, there's a couple reports. We put out one with CT-based assessment. In trauma, wherever there's hematoma and disrupted tissue, if you put in a biologic around the facet, it'll spread to everything that's disrupted. So if they have a PLC disruption at, at say, 11, 12, they got hematoma that extends up to 10, 11 and down to 12, 1, if you put your biologic with master graft, it'll autofuse those levels that have trauma. So again, you can overfuse a patient, unfortunately. Um, one of the other techniques, again, we split the spinous process, again, to avoid that compartment syndrome issue. This is a Chinese technique, um, popular, very popular in China, but uh, we've published a couple uh, papers now, uh, early outcome and two-year outcome on groups of patients in whom we've done this. Again, the uh, preoperative MRI, stenosis there, postoperative MRI, again, illustrating the uh, lack of muscle denervation uh, in that um, in that issue. So again, in MIS, what you're doing is you're preserving the soft tissue envelope. Should give you less, uh, less of a um, infection rate. Again, is it demonstrated to be more effective? Maybe by return to golf in some, some series. Infection rates lower clearly, but are the outcomes dramatically superior like gallbladder disease? No. So we don't have that distinction to market it. And again, our implants, when you think of it, we either have a buttress anteriorly, or a tension band neutralization dorsally. And those are the only two principles we accomplish. So again, when we're doing this, you gotta remember that most of the perk rods are 5.5. Five. There's now some systems that are a little more, more uh, dense. But again, you have a very a relatively flexible rod, which helps us with, um, with osteoporosis, but there's no cross-link. So if you're gonna put in your fixation, you have to triangulate your fixation to avoid that quadrilateral effect. Again, if you put screws in uh, uh, in the axial planes, uh, sagittal plane uh, axially uh, neutral, you can get basically a quadrilateral effect from motion. So again, if you triangulate your screws, it won't do that. So again, sequential reduction, you can compress as you need. Um, and again, is it an alternative to brace? I think ankylosing spondylitis, we have some pretty good data that it's more effective. But again, for the bursts and spondylodiscitis, that stuff's still open. So again, I'm going to cut off there so we're not running too much over. That's okay. <laughs>